study the book of Galatians under our overarching theme of what must I do to be saved. And we came to the book of Galatians because the book of Galatians deals with the doctrine of salvation. And Paul clearly delineates in this marvelous epistle that salvation is by grace through faith. For the person is justified, declared righteous, made right with God through faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ apart from any work on their part. And salvation is all by grace through faith. And so the Apostle Paul lays it out for us in this marvelous epistle. As he comes to the end of the epistle, particularly in chapter 5, he deals with the application of the doctrine that he's taught uh, in verse chapters 1 through 4. And the final two chapters deal with the application. If we know this, then what difference should it make? So in chapter 5, he talks about if we're saved by grace through faith, if we are free in Christ, then we should stand in that freedom, we should stand in that liberty, because Christ saved us for the purpose of setting us free. So we can be free to serve God, free to worship God, free to enjoy the grace of God, and free to share our faith with others. And so he talked about the importance of standing fast, therefore, in the liberty of what Christ hath made us to be free. On well, last week, for the past two weeks actually, last week and the week before, in verses 16 through 26, Paul says, if we're going to live the Christian life, then we're going to live it in the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit inside of us empowers us to live out our faith. So in verse 16 of chapter 5, he says, this I say, then walk in the Spirit, and you should not fulfill the lust of he goes on to delineate this great internal conflict when we talk about the conflict that takes place on the inside of us between our flesh, our humanness, which has a tendency and a propensity to be drawn towards sin, indulgence, and access, and the Spirit of God, which now is trying to move us toward holiness and purity and righteousness. And so Paul says now inside of every Christian, there is a war that is raging. He says, as we learn to be filled with and to walk in the Spirit, then we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. He goes on to say, since we live in the Spirit, let us walk in the Spirit. Then he contrasts the flesh in verses 19 and 20 and 21 with the fruit of the Spirit, so we can examine our own lives and say, which of these things are being produced in my life? Do I see more of the lust of the flesh, or do I see a greater manifestation of the fruit of the Spirit? So as we conclude this epistle in chapter 6, Paul now is going to give us a way to where we can monitor whether or not we are walking in the Spirit. In verses 16 through 26, he talks about the importance of walking in the Spirit, and then in chapter 6, he says, here's how you can monitor whether or not you're walking in Spirit. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. How, how, how we can monitor if we are walking in the Spirit. Look at verse 25 of chapter 5, 25 and 26. Paul says, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit, and let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. So he says, if we live in the Spirit, we walk in the Spirit, we shouldn't be desirous of vain glory. We shouldn't be letting each other's throat all the time, but instead, the fruit of the Spirit should be manifest in our lives, and then he gives us a way to monitor whether or not we walk in the Spirit. And the first thing he says in chapter 6, verse 1 is, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. So the first way that we can monitor whether or not we're walking in the Spirit is how do we respond to a sinning brother? We can monitor whether or not we're walking in the Spirit in our response to a sinning brother. He says, brethren, if a brother be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, lest you also be tempted. How do you respond to a sinning brother or sister to a sinning Christian? Sinning Christians can pluck the last nerve. And what is your response to a sinning Christian? Is your response... They made their bed hard. They now got to live in it. Is your response? They, they should know better than to do that or live like that. Is your response in your, in your highest uh, spirituality and you supposed to be a Christian? 
Is your response judgmental? How do you respond to a sinning Christian? Paul says our first response to a sinning Christian should be the response of trying to restore them. The note he says, brethren, ye which are spiritual. And the spiritual ones are those who fill with the Spirit. The spiritual ones are those who are walking in the Spirit. The spiritual ones are those who are living in the Spirit. So he says, if you are really walking and living in the Spirit, then when you say sinning brother, your first response should not be judgment. Listen to me. Our first response should not be judgment to a sinning Christian. Our first response should be to seek to restore them. The word that Paul uses there for restore is the same word that was used by the Greek physicians to describe the resetting of a broken bone, a broken arm, or a broken leg. If you break a limb, break an arm, break a leg, the doctor will have to, to set it. And sometimes it's painful to reset a broken limb. And if you've ever had a broken limb, you know it can be very painful because the doctor literally, he, he or she is skilled in how to do it. But they got to pull that bone and get it aligned back in position properly. And once the bone is properly aligned and properly in position, then the physicians will then immobilize it, normally with a cast or possibly a splint, depending on the severity of the break, because that's to protect it during the healing process. So Paul says if you are spiritual, then your response to a sinning brother is to seek to restore him or her to restore them and reset them so they can once again be useful to the body of Christ. They can be useful to the family of God and they can be useful to you as a brother or sister in Christ. How we respond to a sinning brother or a sinning sister is a monitor, a barometer of where we are spiritually. Because if we initially respond in judgment, then we just move over to being in the flesh. Then once we do an investigation, once the investigation is done, the investigation might disclose, in the text he says, the brother be overtaken in a fall, and so that could be translated, they, they slipped and fell into it, they kind of got misled into it, but they still got caught red-handed in it. But once you investigate, and if they are obstinate, if they are recalcitrant, if they are stubborn, if they are hard-headed, then the way you deal with them may change. But your initial response should be with tenderness. Your initial response should be with humility. Restore such a one in a spirit of meekness, lest you also be tempted. Now hold your thing in Galatians 6 and turn back to Matthew chapter 7. In Matthew chapter 7, this principle that Paul is laying out here about the ministry of restoration how we respond to a sinning brother or sister, Jesus sort of touches on this himself. In Matthew chapter 7, our Lord says, Judge not that ye be not judged, for what judgment ye judge, ye should be judged, and what measure ye meet, ye should be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thy own eye? Let's stop right there. Jesus says that one of the ways we respond to a sinning brother is in judgment. And so we get our magnifying glass out. As a matter of fact, this morning, but I'm always looking at my disciples very closely. See how they're doing. So I'm looking. So I looked at Brother Tyler, not to judge him, but see how my brother's doing. So I look in his eye, and I know that he has a, a mark in his eye. And I say, hey, man, what, what, what's happened to your eye? Because I'm ready to go to fist and come somebody hit him in the eyes. <laughs> if he's been in a fight somewhere, let's, let's go get him. Let's see what's going on. Well, he explained to me the situation. A, a small situation where he's had a problem with his eye and he's left a red mark in his eye. Now my approaching him is to see how can I help, not to be judgmental. So Jesus says, how can you behold, look what he says there, the mote is in our brother's eye, and the word mote, it is a speck. So to see a speck in somebody's eye, you've got to be looking pretty close. I mean, you've got to be really examining pretty close. So he says, you can see a speck of dust in your brother's eye, but you cannot see the beam that's in your own eye, a tumor force. So you got a tumor force sticking out of your eye, your brother got a speck of dust in his eye, yet you're focusing on how to get the speck of dust out of his eye and not the tumor force out of your own eye. How in the world can 
what Jesus said, you got to first remove the beam, the two of four out of your own eye, so you would have clear vision and be able to see. Amen. The same idea here of this ministry of restoration in the spirit of meekness and gentleness. How we respond to people who are in trouble, how we respond to them is a barometer of where we are spiritually, and if we respond in judgment, if we respond with cold, callous, apathetic indifference, we have reason to question whether or not we are really walking in the spirit. So we say you restore such a one in the spirit of meekness or gentleness, and with humility lest you also be tempted. Verse 3, or verse 2, bear you one of this bird, and so fulfill the law of Christ. So this has an idea of there are times when people have a load that is too heavy for them to bear. And so how we respond to sinning people who are laboring under a heavy load is a barometer and a way of wanting for we are spiritually. And so we as Christians have to want to come alongside of each other to bear loads that are too heavy for us to bear. For if a man thinks himself to be something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. So when we look at other people who are going through something, and if we are not careful, we will say, I would never do that. Those are the famous last words. God will make you eat those words. Anytime you see someone doing something, and they might have fallen into some gross sin, and if you are tempted to say, I would never do that, take your own hand and shove it in your mouth and twist the words back down inside of you because God will make you eat those words. And that's what Paul says, be careful. Be careful lest you also find yourself in the same situation. How we respond to sinning brothers and sisters can help us monitor where we are spiritually. Verse 4, but let every man prove his own work, then shall he have rejoicing in himself and alone and not in another. For every man should bear his own burden, a different word. This burden is a load that you've got to bear for yourself. There's some things you have to bear for yourself. There's some things that are too heavy for you to bear. But there are some backpacks you've got to bear by yourself. Because God wants us to learn that he is a burden bearer and that the Lord will help us bear those things he's called us to bear. Look at verse 6. How we respond to sinning brothers a way of monitoring our spiritual uh, growth and what we're walking in, in, in the spirit and how we recognize or recognition of our spiritual leaders is also a way of us monitoring what we're walking in the spirit. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. And so he says the way we respond to those in spiritual leadership, the way we respond to their teaching, their instruction, and our willingness to cooperate and to participate is an indication of where we are spiritually. If we always think that we got a better mousetrap, if we always conclude they don't know what they're doing, they don't know what they're talking about, it may be that we have a problem submitting to spiritual leadership. So he says we are to recognize those in spiritual leadership. We are to share with those in spiritual leadership. And we are to recognize the benefit that their ministry have, has in our lives. Now I'm grateful, grateful to the Lord for this church. This church is a very generous church. It's been very generous in sharing uh, with, with me personally, with my family. And for that, I will be eternally grateful to this ministry. And that is an indication to where this ministry is spiritual. It is a spiritual barometer in a way for the ministry to measure and to monitor itself spiritually. Look at what else Paul says in verse 7. He said, Be not deceived, God is not mocked, whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. We that soweth to his flesh, shall the flesh reap corruption. We that soweth to the spirit, shall the spirit reap life everlasting. Our response to a sinning brother, our recognition of spiritual leadership, thirdly, our remembrance of the principle of sowing, reaping, and sharing. You see, one of the marks of, of, of human fallenness is that we have a tendency to forget. How many times have you forgot something you knew that you should remember and said, I can't believe I forgot it. And so that's why in the Bible we always have to be reminded. And that's why Peter says, in his epistle, Peter says, he says, I don't mind reminding you something you already know because I know you have a tendency to forget. And so
And so we must remember the spiritual principle, the principle of sowing, the principle of reaping, and the principle of sharing. And as we remember the principle of sowing, reaping, and sharing, it helps us to monitor ourselves where we are spiritually. He says, be not deceived. Don't be in deception. Don't be mocked. Whatever you sow, that ye shall also reap. Now this is in the context of walking in the Spirit and living in the Spirit. And so what he's saying to us is that if we sow spiritual things, we will reap a spiritual harvest. If we sow fleshly things, we're going to reap a fleshly harvest, and the fleshly harvest will be a harvest that will result in corruption and in decay. And we are living in a society today where, where we are deceived into believing that we can sow physical fleshly uh, seed and reap a spiritual harvest. So in our society today, we see a proliferation of immorality, bombarding with immorality on television, with the internet, and the printed page, and so forth. In some kind of way, we think we can sow that type of seed and not reap the harvest, the consequence that comes along with sowing that type of seed, the physical corruption, that's the result. Be not deceived, he says. Whatsoever you sow, that should you also reap. You cannot plant a bean and expect to get corn. We must learn to sow in a spiritual seed and spiritual soil. And so he said, what are you saying, preacher? Why do we make so big deal about people getting in discipleship classes and in Sunday school classes? Because that is a sowing of your time. You are sowing your time. You are sowing your time in your own spiritual life. So you're taking the time out to be in a class where you can learn the Bible, learn spiritual principles, and learn how to apply those principles so that you can see a spiritual harvest burst forth in your life. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever man saw, that shall also reap. We must remember this is a biblical principle that cannot be violated. Whatever we sow, that we also reap. He goes on to say, But he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. And he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. And then we often quote the next verse, verse 9, but verse 9 is, has to be interpreted in the context of verses 6, 7, and 8. And let us not be weary in well doing. If we sow to the Spirit, then we are going to be continually revived and rejuvenated spiritually. And so when spiritual fatigue would set into our lives because we sow to the Spirit, we get revived again by the Spirit so we don't grow weary in the well-doing. We don't collapse on the spiritual fatigue. So he says, if we sow to the Spirit, we shall love the Spirit, reap a harvest, and that harvest will enable us to not become spiritually fatigued and spiritually exhausted and to give out in our service of the Lord. Remember the principle of sowing, reaping, and share as a way of measuring and monitoring your own spirituality and as to whether you walk in the spirit. Verse 10, as we therefore have opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are the household of faith. And so we have a unique opportunity and a unique obligation to minister to each other. And this is what much, much, many churches never understand. And many Christians never really understand this. Is that God does not save us for us to be independent, free moral agents all by ourselves. God saves us and God connects us to the body of Christ whether we like it or not. That is God's divine prerogative and God has chosen to establish a spiritual body that he manifests himself in physically through the people that he saves. And then God constructs and configures those believers into local New Testament churches to where they develop an interdependence upon each other. They then have the responsibility to 
sow into each other's lives, as they sow into each other's lives, they help each other grow spiritually, and as they sow in each other's lives, they then can reap a benefit from each other. And that they have a unique obligation to each other to pray for each other, to encourage each other, to try to strengthen each other, to try to promote the spiritual well-being of each individual member so that the body can be robust and spiritually fit, so the body can minister more effectively to the individual members. Now listen to what I'm saying. You're not a good church member if you just come to church. You're not a good church member if you just come to church and if you tie up your income. You're not a good church member if you only come to church and sing in the choir. You are only a good church member as you understand that I am interdependent upon the other members of that local body, that I have a responsibility to that local body, I have a responsibility to find out where I am gifted or where I have talents at, so that I can, the body can benefit from my, my, my ability and my skills and my talent. And that I am a good church member when I understand that I am a continuation of the body of Christ. Amen. And that I am uniquely connected to that local New Testament church. That I am tied into those believers. And that I have a responsibility to promote their spiritual well-being. As well as having to promote my spiritual well-being. That's what it means to be a Christian. Amen. What it means to be a Christian is to understand that I am in a relationship with Jesus Christ. And because I'm in a relation with Jesus Christ, I'm in a relation with everybody else in Jesus Christ's family, the rest of his children, and I am in a unique relationship with those with which I commit myself by my own choice to unite with in a local body. Are you following? I don't have the same responsibility that every Christian that I have to you. I am not responsible for every Christian's spiritual growth and spiritual development. I'm not responsible for every Christian's well-being but I am responsible for yours. Because I have to stand before God and give account at the judgment seat of Christ for my faithfulness in trying to promote your spiritual well-being through prayer, through creating fellowship, by encouraging you, by preaching the word of God, by challenging you and encouraging you to recommit to your own spiritual growth. I am responsible for God for you. And you're responsible before God for each other. And that's what the church never really quite understands. That we are responsible for each other. We bear each other's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. We encourage one another. We pray for one another. We exhort one another. We minister to one another. And in doing that, the body grows. Amen. we got to remember this principle of sowing, of reaping, and sharing. And as we remember that, we will we realize that he's not walking in the spirit, I'm not walking in the spirit. And that I can make the adjustments I need to make. I don't mean to bore you. One more principle, I'm going to sit down. We can monitor our spiritual growth well enough to walk in the Spirit by response to sinning brothers, by recognition of spiritual leaders, by remembering the principle of sowing, reaping, and sharing. And then finally, we can monitor our spiritual growth and well enough to walk in the Spirit by our reliance upon the cross. By our reliance upon the cross of Christ. Paul writes, to the Galatians. You see how large letters I've written unto you with my own hand. As many desire to make a fair show in the flesh, verse 12, they constrain you to be circumcised, only that they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. Paul still is hung up on his whole idea of the false teachers trying to tell the Jew, the Galatians, you have to be circumcised if you are a male to be a true Christian. And that being obligates you, Paul says, to try to keep the rest of the law, which you cannot keep. But Paul says they're only doing that to make a showing. Because they don't really want to suffer persecution for the cross sake. They're trying to avoid suffering persecution for the cross of Jesus Christ. And that's what we see happening in our society today. If you say you are religion, religious, and if you get together with other folks in the ecumenical service, and if you say, we are the world, we are all God's children, people will commend you for that. And they will, they will encourage you for promoting ecumenism and promoting unity within the body of Christ. And let's not be divisive. And let's not be mean spirit. But if you stand up and say, no, wait a minute, I love all of y'all. We all are God's children by creation. We all created as a result of God's divine fiat. But we're not all God's children by relationship. But we're all that God's children as we turn away from our own way and put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Once you make that statement, once you bring up the fact that you believe the only people who put their faith in Christ are saved on their way to heaven,
heaven, you just become extremely unpopular. Amen. Amen. Once you say that the cross of Jesus Christ, the symbol, the emblem of our faith, which symbolizes where Jesus Christ died and shed his blood and gave his life for our sins, once you say that only through faith in Christ, in the Christ that was crucified on the cross of Calvary on God's house of hill, once you say that, you are perceived as being narrow-minded and as being divisive. But Paul says you can measure and you can model your spirituality by your reliance on the cross. On your reliance on the cross, when you realize that I'm saved because Jesus Christ was crucified on the cross. That I'm being sanctified because Christ was crucified on the cross and was raised from the dead and sent back the Holy Spirit. And I live the Christian life because of my relationship with the crucified Christ, who's now risen from the dead. Paul says we can monitor where we are spiritually by our dependency and by our reliance on the cross of Christ, which symbolizes his death on our behalf. And so we can get so smart that we start trusting in our intelligence. We become so wealthy that we start trusting in our wealth. We become so powerful that we start trusting in our political influence and our political clout. We can become so healthy and go to so many novices and so many YWCA and YMCA's, we trust in our physical health. But Paul says, God forbid that I should glory except in the cross of Jesus Christ. Amen. Our reliance on him. Our reliance upon Christ, and we're drawing our life from Christ, and he is our wisdom and our righteousness, our sanctification, and our strength. It's in him we live and move and have our being, and we're able to do because of him. We're able to think because of him. We're able to execute and discharge because of him. We're reliant totally upon him. Our reliance on the cross. Let me wrap it up right here. Verse 13, he says, for me to they themselves, who are circumcised, keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised, that they may glory in your flesh. Paul said, they just want to glory to be able to say, they say it because of me. I told them how to get saved. They say it because of me. They want to glory, Paul said. And then Paul said in verse 14, but God forbid that I should glory. Set or saved in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. Paul says, I have no reason to boast. I have no reason to glory. I have no reason to brag. I have no reason to be arrogant. I have no reason to be boastful. God forbid I should glory, Paul says. God forbid I should boast except in the cross of Christ. He says, by which the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. What are you saying, Paul? Paul says, when I put my faith in Jesus Christ, when I renounce Judaism, when I said that salvation is by faith through the finished work of Christ, when I said it's all about Jesus Christ, the world now doesn't have no use for me. Paul said, the world doesn't have any real use for me. He said, but guess what? I don't have no use for the world either. There's nothing the world really can do for me, Paul says. I don't need its accolades. I don't need its recognition. I don't need its attention. I don't need its systems. I'm crucified to the world. I'm a crucified man, Paul says, living in this world system. So I never accept, expect for this world system to totally be friendly toward me. Because of my reliance upon the cross. And he closes by saying, for Christ Jesus' circumcision, it don't mean nothing. Uncircumcision don't mean nothing but a new creature. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace on them, and mercy upon the true Israel. That's a little Pauline web, another jab at the end. On the Israel of God, the true Savior, the true citizens of Abraham, not only physically, but spiritually through faith in Christ. And then he closed by saying, for henceforth, let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ is be with your spirit. Paul says, from now on, I ain't worried about the Lord. He says, from now on, I will not allow people to trouble me. People's assessment, people's appraisals, people's opinions. And that's what some of your problem is. Some of you spend so much time trying to win public opinion. You spend so much time trying to convince people to like you. I'm 
not saying we go out and be abrasive toward people, but as long as your contentment and as long as your peace of mind is dependent upon someone else's fragile, and is held by the fragile thread of someone else's opinion of you, you will always be a person that will be anxious. And you can you always wonder whether or not you have the approval of certain individuals. Paul says, I can't be preoccupied with that. I'm striving for God's approval, for God's divine favor. I'm striving for God say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. And once we seek for God's approval, we'll have God's peace. And we can turn off our frustration motor, and we can turn off our aggravation motor, and we can turn off all of our anxiety motors, and we can realize that in Jesus Christ, we are complete, and we are whole. And that we have value, and we have worth, and that we have meaning, and there's something that God is doing in and through us to spread the good news of the gospel of the grace of God. And that nothing can separate us from the love of God. And so we can experience God's peace and God's favor. God wants us to respond favorably to sinning brothers. He wants us to recognize our spiritual leaders and pray for them and encourage them so that they can continue to be strong to help us to be strong. And he wants us to remember the principles sowing and reaping and sharing. But ultimately, he wants to realize that we are what we are by the grace of God. Amen. We stand in the cost of the Lord Jesus Christ because of his death on the cross, his birth, his blood that was shed, his resurrection, and the Holy Spirit that he now has sent to be our comforter, to be our guide, and to be our friend. And if you're here this morning, if you've never by faith accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, we would offer you an opportunity to come to know the living God through faith in his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. The only way that you would ever make heaven your home, the only way you ever experience God's forgiveness, is to realize that I am a lost sinner. And I cannot save myself. But Jesus Christ died in my place. He was buried. And he was raised from the dead on the third day. And I put all my faith and my trust in him. And I rely totally completely and absolutely upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. If you do that, you can be saved, and you can be saved today, and you can know that you're saved. Amen. Let's bow together, shall we? Is there one here this morning?